Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today from a van by Alessio. From a van, hello. Fen. Hello. And I will be your host, Alexis. Uh, we'll be talking about Kiri I, the Jewel, Dawn of the Z, and Body of Evidence. But first, we'll start with seeing how everyone is doing in the Standy Catch Up. So, first of all, Happy New Year to all of you. Happy uh, New Year! Yeah. And, uh, Happy birthday to my mum, because that's 1st of January as well, belated. Oh. We're not recording on 1st of January, but, you know, it's more <laughs> a birthday than a Happy New Year in, in our family. Yeah. Uh, how, how was the holidays for you, Alessio? And why am I in a van? Mostly. Oh, uh, uh, unless, unless this is like Lethal Company and you're the man in the van or um, uh, <laughs> Phasmophobia, um, you know, I'm sure there's a, a less exciting reason. Uh, yeah, le absolutely less exciting reasons. So uh, I'm kindly, I usually recording uh, in the poses from work. And this time we have the city of visiting, so my co-workers uh, and friends will probably know, we will be able to exactly timestamp this day, but uh, uh, there's the city of visiting, so the, uh, the meeting room I'm using is booked, so I am recording from a lab van here. <laughs> it's a bit cramped. Uh, I, did, I did park outside, uh, outside the, the, the town uh, that's hosting our offices, so I'm not, not far from the school, so that, that's all, that there are all the bad assumptions uh, for police to stop by. <laughs> so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully everything will be alright. Uh, but uh, uh, that as, putting that aside, uh, the, the vacations were kind of cool. Okay, it was. It has been a bad year hand for me myself for personal reasons, but the the year for gaming was actually pretty great. So there there were a lot of backlog games that I wanted to try. I I, I basically managed to to give a try to all the games from uh, SN that I did not yet test. For instance, a match at Tales to Maze, which was pretty good. Uh, Sky Team, which was my favorite to game, to to, ga to play your game for the last year, but we will talk about it. Uh, the aforementioned Kiri the Duel, the Challengers Beach Cup, so it, it was a lot of games for with a lot of people and with family for once. So it was pretty good, I, I think. And what about anyone else? I don't know, Fan, for instance. Well, um, we're just hopefully on the tail end of the coldest temperatures um, on, uh, like, in, I think it's 25 years around here. Um, it's not so bad uh, on Gotland because we're coastal, we're nearer the like sa southern side of Sweden, but it's, it's apparently gotten to minus 40 degrees. Uh, yesterday, uh, up in Finland, I, I heard from someone, which is uh, fun, and... Um, our dog's very, she's very unhappy with everything because it's too cold for her to go out. You put her in a coat and she hates that. You put her outside in a coat and she just sits there and shivers and asks to go back inside. But she's bored inside, so it's a pain in the butt. Um, in respect to uh, games, um, let's have a little look. I started using the BG Stats app uh, in order to track my plays Whoa. a bit better that's an addiction no it's uh he, he hasn't i'm not addicted to it uh i started a 10 by 10 you know that's where you play 10 games 10 times over the year i started that start of december and <laughs> i'm halfway done because like some of them i picked just didn't take too long to play so i'll probably have to do another one um a bit further down the line <laughs> Uh, let's see, because uh, it mostly though it lets me track and keep an eye on things. I don't log my Kingdom Death plays though because that's kind of unless I play with my partner, that's no longer a game um, for me, unfortunately. Um, right. Uh, no, I'm I'm not finding the correct page. Oh no, here we are. I'll play statistics. Yes, yeah, so I played uh, a lot of cartographers and Race for the Galaxy. I played Mystic Veil, vale, which has transparent cards. Um, it's a nice idea. Uh, it's better than the other transparent cards game I've played, which is Gloom, 
Um, it uses the transparent cards in a similar fashion where you kind of lay them into each other. But it's sort of, I don't know, it's not quite there. Um, I, it's a lot fiddly. It, I, I, I ended up playing it on the app version, which handles a lot of the fiddliness and gets exactly. rid of it. Exactly. Um, and then I'm like, well, what what am I doing? Um, no, no. <laughs> it's like, what's, what's the point? Um, I've been playing Hero Realms because I wanted to write about older boss battlers for a while. And Hero Realms is uh, one of the earlier ones. Um, with its campaign stuff, uh, I picked up Legacy of You, which I have yeah. no formed opinion on yet. I'm feeling kind of mixed about it. I'm going to finish the campaign. I'm halfway through now, um, and I like the principle, but I'm currently leaning towards Hadrian's Wall campaign just being a better experience and more challenging. Um, the game kind of has a fail-forward system where if you lose, it gives you lots of stuff to help you out. Um, and if you win, it like makes things way more difficult. So you have this streaky situation where you're winning and then losing and winning and losing. And it doesn't feel, um, it's, it doesn't feel like the wins and losses are entirely your fault or your achievements at times. So uh, when I get to the end, I'll uh, probably talk about it on the podcast. Um, I do like the production, though. Um, and I like the idea of a legacy game that's resettable. Um, it's just when you play the first game, if you go, is that it? The answer is kind of, yes. It's not going to reinvent the wheel, but still. Um, yeah, beyond that... I, I thought uh, I thought you could compare it to Space Kraken, maybe? Um, well, I know Space Kraken's like... When, when, that, lot, when that arrives, that is way more no, in-depth. <laughs> No, I'm still waiting for oh, it. I just received it, so I, I really don't know. It's a lot more, yes, but it uh, works like a roguelite. I, I, would be, I would be closer to com starting to compare Legacy of Dragonholt to Space Kraken, and I think Space Kraken's way more involved than Legacy of Dragonholt, or Roleplayer Adventures, maybe, which is really good. But anyhow, yeah, so that's been it. It's been snow, uh, it's been lots of trips to bring wood in from the woodshed, um, and an unhappy dog, and... Very happy birds, but it's ideal board game playing whether it's when I get a lot of my board gaming done because as uh, Carla can attest, uh, Cara can attest, the, um, the attic gets too hot during the summer, so I have to play outside, so that limits the games I can play. So, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, I can imagine that. Oh, you have no idea, it's so... It's crazy how far this island swings from like Mediterranean summers to... Uh, mild Swedish winters. It's yeah. uh, just consider that we are on twelve Celsius degrees right now. Yeah, I don't want to live somewhere where it's twelve right now. I love seasonal. Yeah. I, the idea of living on the equator—that you might as well just be a blamange. You know, it's not for me. <laughs> and, no, it's a hot. It's out winter. Any, right? Anyway, we should get on with the games. But beforehand, uh, Alexis, what's been with you? Well, I spent a lovely new year on a houseboat in the Netherlands with my parents. That was uh, pretty enjoyable. I had I had a pretty good time over the holidays and recently I've been in a binge of the Mysterious Package Company games. Um, I used to play a little bit more a little bit more of the more ARGs game a few years back and then recently uh, since I received a couple of Kickstarters I've started playing through the backlog, basically, which I'll talk about uh, later in the episode. Um, <laughs> nothing too uh, important worth mentioning, except that I'll do a very slight plug for a small game called Voice Stranger, Void Stranger. Um, if you are okay playing through uh, soccer band puzzles, this is an extremely interesting game that I would recommend mm. you to check because it has a lot of hidden things. It reminds me a little bit of um, Pony Island uh, in, in the way that it hides things. If you're okay with Sokoban plays, I would recommend diving into it blind. Uh, po po Pony Island is a big name. Pony Island is great. And I think that Void Stranger is uh, really special. But I'm not going to say too much okay, about it. I've been I'll obsessed with it. this game for like a few days now. Um, 
This aside, uh, I think it is time to, to dive into the episode. So first of all, we are going to uh, be talking about an extremely stylish game. I really like the design of that one, uh, and I'm, I'm very interesting to, interested to hear about uh, what you have to say, uh, Alessio. Uh, the game is called Kiri Eye, uh, The Jewel. Yeah, uh, you got it right uh, the first try. Uh, the game is very stylish. Uh, mostly because it is a game designed by Kami Bayashi, a Japanese designer who is actually, as his main job, uh, a graphic designer. So uh, this is all the more impressive because a game this good, but we are about to talk about it, from a first-time designer who is a graphic designer is, is really something uh, to think about. So uh, what is Kiri Eye the Duo? Uh, it's a two-player game, strictly two-player game, in which the players are two samurais on a duel on the side of a cliff, and they are doing uh, basically what is a samurai duel like uh, you see in uh, a very old game called Bushido Blade. If you ever are old enough or interested enough to check it out it was basically a, a realistic game where you had uh, where you had a, where you played as a samurai playing duels when one hit you are severely wounded tripled maybe and two hits you are dead and this is the spirit of kiri the duel it's a card game, meaning that uh, one card will represent the, the, the battlefield as a set of squares uh, linearly placed. Another card for each of the players will represent the samurai placed on the battlefield, so there will be distance in play and po a relative positioning. And after that, you have a deck of simple five cards, which will always be in your hand at all the times and are the same for each player, and one special move drawn randomly uh, from a pool of three. So uh, basically each player will be, de will be dealt at the beginning one special move, they will know their, their, their own, and they cannot be sure of the uh, special move the other player has. With that, you basically play the game. This is a very quick game, it's a filler game where the player with the most analysis paralysis uh, will, uh, will play it still in 7 or 8 minutes and it's an addictive experience because basically uh, on, the, on, on the New Year's Eve we managed to play it uh, in turns for one hour straight so this is the kind of game uh, you, are, you are looking at. Basically, uh, eh, the game is very simple, the turns happen at the same time, where you play two cards blind, and those are your two actions, they are one after the other, uh, and the both actions are resolved simultaneously, the first one for both players, and the second one for, the, for both players. So basically, uh, you, move, uh, you, you play cards, Cards can be movement, change stance, you can be in heaven or hearth stance with a high guard or a low guard, and then after that you move, like you charge ahead, you can move uh, carefully one step forward or one step backward, and then you have attack cards. You have an attack from heaven, from heaven stance when you can hit one or uh, a couple of squares away, you have an attack from hearth stance when you can eat from one square away and you have a balanced attack which can be both which can be done in both stances uh, which it's on the same square that's basically it the game is just uh, like a real samurai duel like you you would see in a kurosawa movie it's basically uh, the tension growing the players trying to figure out what the other player will be doing and then swiftly you move and strike that's all the beauty of the game and that's it to spice thing up, things up you have uh, a set of special attacks which is uh, a card that you can use only once 
uh, in the entire fuel and uh, once once you use it uh, it's done and it's basically uh, either an attack you can run from a stance it uh, attacks at, at a very weird uh, range from that stance and changes stance at the at the end for instance uh, when you are in earth stance you are close range but the attack from uh, the special attack uh, it's very far from two or three squares away and then puts you in heaven stance uh, the same for the heaven stance if you are in heaven stance you are usually long range but the attack attacks from zero or one squares away and then puts you in earth stance so they are very 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 powerful attacks which can change completely the 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 course of the duel but there is the third card which is beautiful which is the counter attack basically when your opponent manages to eat you you can sell that eat and you inflict a wound instead so basically that's it uh, you have to uh, if you don't have a counter attack you always are careful about what you are about to do because you could be counter attacked and if you have the counter attack in end you always uh, you are always trying to figure out when your opponent will strike to not waste that counter attack that's basically the game the other very beautiful thing which uh, makes the game all that uh, all that all the more thinky is the fact that the second actions each turn for both players won't be available next turn so basically you will always waste your second action so it's not a, a automatic that the attack will be used as a second uh, that uh, allows for a lot of variable uh, uh, situations during a duel the duel will be resolved fast because first it you are wounded second it you are dead and that's basically it the game is elegant is simple is addictive and you are always wanting to play it once more any questions uh yep yeah. uh so how does it compare to unmatched oh uh, unmatched is way is way uh we are talking of course of the competitive mode of unmatched i i don't see the comparison very fit because unmatched is uh, is a lot more it gives you a lot of situations but the 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 game turn is uh, beautiful and i think i prefer the kiriai version of the turn although a match is very simple but the uh, asymmetry and the counters and the meta game that appears in a match is unmatched actually mm -hmm. so uh, yeah it, it's it's to scratch different itches if you want a fast filler with a duel which feels satisfying when when all you need is to guess what your opponent will do and try to see through a bluff that's kiriai if you want an asymmetric experience which is a fuel duel with sidekicks and a three-dimensional uh, battlefield the well a match is still the best uh, fighter around asymmetric however that's only if you don't yeah. happen to have duplicates i've played sherlock versus sherlock <laughs> no 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 double sherlock Sher double sherlock is a mess but i i could tell you that probably bloody mary versus daredevil uh, could be something of the asymmetry you see in korea meaning that you are always striving to achieve specific conditions but you are not trying to give them away because your cards will be discarded if you play like that so the feeling could be like Electra, uh, like Daredevil versus Bloody Mary in a match, but a match is the most complete uh, experience there is. I think it's my best uh, one versus one, uh, well, my best actually uh, fighter game because it's not just one versus one. Mm, yeah, I, but I, I, would, I can compare it. Yeah, yeah I was going to say originally you had Unmatched Tales to Amaze down as the topic, so. I was doing, yeah. doing, doing prep research on Unmatched and getting back into it. But uh, it's also, uh, Kara <laughs> isn't here, so I can say that I've got Star Wars Epic Duels. So 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't play Star Wars Epic Heroes, re- it's, so I... Well, everything in Unmatched, you know, it's there, um, uh, but, like, more Star Warsy and a little bit it's more It's taken epic. from, yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, I would compare it uh, to Combo Fighter, though, because Combo Fighter is in a similar range. Is uh, Combo Fighter, it's like playing an arcade game. If you want to play Street Fighter or Tekken, then you are playing combo fighter and you you'd like it better but if you like bushido blade for instance or uh, shogun showdown the the game i was playing the the steam game i was playing very good uh, game yeah when you program actions well that feeling is is taken perfectly by uh, kiri the duo so that's basically it you can find it in the us distributed by mugen games and you can find it in Europe and elsewhere by Lucky Duck Games. It's a twenty. It's a twenty euros games. Uh, twenty, twenty or thirty euros depending on your location. And the production is beautiful. The game is delivered uh, through a cloth uh, card holder which resembles the mon uh, of uh, of a Japanese family. You can see, for instance, if you watch the, uh, the, the great Shogun Mitsukunimito or stuff like uh, uh, Lone Wolf and Cub, uh, you know, these cloth, uh, these cloth mounds. Uh, the game is beautiful and evocative and it's a piece of art. So that's it. I, it's a definitely a recommendation for the cost, for the time involved and for the portability of it. It's 13 cards plus 3 cards for terrain and samurais, and uh, it's beautiful. It looks very pretty. That's that's something that I have to say. Just uh, the striking art style, I think I'm going to, to grab that one. Yeah, uh, fun fact, I during the these holidays I brought it up uh, four times with four different people. All of them bought the game by the day I demoed them. It's it's also very cheap, which helps. Uh, I just yeah. looked it up. The game on the official website, so, so buying it from the US, so it's probably a bit more expensive than that with our shipping, is like $12. Uh, $12. And yeah. I found it in, in Europe for like 15 just Yeah, it right now. yeah L- Lucky Duck ships from Poland, and it's like about 12 20 possibly euros so cheap beautiful stylish fun it's all you need in a game is just be aware that it's a filler game so you probably need something else for your game night okay you still there yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> i'm done <laughs> It is it is a, a rather pretty game. I think I'm going to, to try that one. Um, on my end, uh, also over the holidays, I've uh, I've enjoyed a few games by the Mysterious Package Company. So it's a company that mostly makes uh, ARG games with a lot of props and puzzles. Uh, previously, they've released uh, curious Correspondents, which are short little stories that are designed to be a sort of mini escape room that each of them lasts about two hours. They are full of puzzles and codes to crack. Um, I got I got a couple of them over the, the holidays to, to try the, and, and enjoy them. Um, I would definitely recommend them to anyone that is interested to dip their toes into it because each chapter costs about 15 euros with uh, bundles that, that group a few of them uh, that are a lot cheaper than that. Um, Perfect escape room range then. Yeah. Very much, yes. Uh, the couple that I've played are also all non-destructive. So if you want to re-gift them, uh, you definitely can do that. They all are great fun and they have a sort of um, national treasure vibe to them. So a little bit campier than Indiana Jones. Uh, it is kind of fun. It's also all in cardboard and it feels a little bit cheap sometimes, but uh, since that is reflected in the price, I, I think that that definitely works. Uh, for example, in the, the first chapter, you have a set of keys and the keys are just 
you know card vault key uh but they do they do um serve their purpose um and all of their puzzles often require you to play around with those pieces of cardboard so it is very tactile and it it cannot just be something that is is just printed out so it it feels it feels pretty nice so the the company also made more prestigious uh premium experiments uh those cost about um i think that the cheapest is at 8 euros with the more expensive one at uh, 150 or 200 and those are centered about massive non cardboard props so um for example i had the one um inspired by the king in yellow it came in a small wooden crate uh, inside of it there was a metal statue uh, of the king in yellow that i still use as a, a prop when i play um, call of cthulhu or that i just have on my shelf because it looks pretty um it has less emphasis on puzzles but still some um little handouts and little um newspaper clippings that you are supposed to put together to kind of understand what's happening there they feel a little bit more like props for a role-playing game and the quality is always really nice um recently through kickstarter they have they have started to branch out into a sort of medium range uh, of games that are uh more playful than the um, uh, the big uh, premium ones and also a lot less expensive uh but still be- uh, higher quality than the curious correspondent stuff um two games specifically that came out uh i think in end of november or early december um do mention that i'll talk about next week probably and body of evidence so body yeah. of yeah, I saw your picture. That's actually quite interesting. Yes. <laughs> I want to hear this. I, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, about it in details. Uh, it is very interesting. I would um, actually uh, offer you to to give it a quick Google, see what it looks like, because the game is is kind of interesting in the way that it does props. So, Body of Evidence is a murder mystery putting you into the shoes of a detective set to review what seems to be the accidental death of a chef and pretty obviously uh through the investigation you'll understand that it is actually a murder mystery and not an accident mystery which wouldn't be as interesting Uh, the way the game is played is through a series of props that you open up uh, in turn as the investigation proceeds you have three folders full of handouts that you'll have to uh, read and then make a guess on who the real murderer was. Um, First of all, uh, I think that's worth pointing out, the game is almost flawless in its aesthetic. Uh, Each folder contains interview extract, uh, files on the people involved, newspaper clippings. It all looks really nice. Um, The little profile on each character has like a a paper clip that's old uh, a picture of the the character and there's there's a there's a lot of elements that you're going to play with and La- when you like open up, a, yeah like a real paper clip yeah a real pa- paper whoa. clip yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> i don't know if it's a whoa because no it's, it's cool it's but, cool but it is very it's, cool yeah um, it's like a police file it is exactly like a police files and it really puts you into the um, uh into the game uh whenever i open the file I, I played it with my sister whenever i open the file immediately uh the both of us were like peering through the documents and reading them and trying to uh figure out what happened and and telling each other what we were reading uh it's it's all very fun in a, in a playful way um i quite like that um, it's immersive yeah yeah, the, the pièce de résistance of the game, uh, though, is a large corpse made out of a folded cardboard piece that you have to physically cut open as you conduct an autopsy. Um, it is it is quite fun. Uh, you have to actually cut into the cardboard because it's like multi-layered and underneath you're going to discover some hints for what happened. But this is also where two small issues arised. Um, First of all, they had planned for the body to be delivered into a small-sized plastic body bag, but they had an issue with the manufacturer and the body bag that comes with the box is slightly too small. Uh, It does not impact the gameplay in the slightest, but I think it's worth mentioning. 
Um, I don't know if it, they're going to fix it for the next release or if they're still selling the, the, those version of if this was just uh, the Kickstarter ones. I've not been able to get any information on that, but um, it's just, it's worth knowing, but it doesn't imp impact the gameplay at all. Uh, secondly, the game requires you to do some destruction onto the props, uh, specifically that, that body that you have to cut open. It makes sense, obviously, after cutting it, it will be uh, uh, altered. It's nothing that would impact your playability, but the game will be physically different after you're done. Uh, so it's not really regiftable. You can share it with friends, you can you can give it after the facts, but the game can only be played fresh once. Um, and given that it's mostly an open and shut story, once you're done through the whole thing, you're not going to play it again, and you probably want to, to offer it to, to some friends, that is something that is worth mentioning. Uh, but the, the novelty of, uh, of cutting through the, the body is quite interesting, so I'll land a little bit on the middle here, where this probably could have uh, been avoided, but it, it does elevate the game a little bit. Now, to explain how the game works, um, you have three folders. You open each folder in turn. Uh, you read through the information that you're given. You take note on what seems important. Then, before you can open the next folder, you have to interact with the body. You have a little explanation what the autopsy is going to be. Um, the autopsy itself is not super interesting. Um, you basically open the flap and you're given a tiny puzzle, like you see maybe some shapes and you have to then uh, cross-reference them with the manual. Um, and that gives you what was the weapon of the motor, for example. Um, and the, you just get a answer that feels a little bit more arbitrary. You don't really have to make a deduction or anything. Once you opened all three files and read through all of the documents, you have all that you need to figure out who the, the, the main culprit was. Um, I thought that on the gameplay side, compared to other games from uh, the Mysterious Package Company, uh, Body of Evidence was lacking a bit of direction. By the end of the game, you have a ton of information spread over those three files, and the only logic behind the breakdown in three folders is that it's, it's there to make it more digestible. There's not really any reason to give you uh, this interview before, this newspaper clipping, um, in the end, you still have to have digested all of it to make sense of what the, the mystery is. Uh, there's not a lot of guidance, uh, and if you require any, you kind of have to look online or ask on the Discord, because the game is not there to help you with that. Um, I didn't thought that was too big of an issue, but... Um, when we'll talk about it next week, but for example, Doom Mansion is way more segmented and it's very clear what puzzles you are currently solving at the moment in uh, Doom Mansion, while in Body of Evidence it's very open and there's a lot of red earrings. It's really fun if you like to figure out a whodunit. Uh, it is a little bit less if you were expecting something that is more puzzly. The game itself is sold for 37 euros. Um, which is a fair price for it, I believe. The full game will get you about three hours of gameplay. Uh, it's a bit expensive for the time that you play out of it, but the props elevate it, I think. And I don't think that 37 is, is too expensive. I think that if it was 50, I would probably be a little bit more uh, middling on that. But at under 40 euros, it's it's a pretty, pretty nice game to hop on. Um, I do think that if you're interested with a mysterious package company, you might want to check out the Curious Correspondence first, since those are a lot cheaper and a lot easier and accessible. Um, or if you want an experience that is a little bit more premium, you wait until next week and you hear about, uh, well, in next episode, so in two weeks, <laughs> and hear about uh, Dimension, which is a extremely high recommendation on my part. But Body of Evidence will definitely scratch that uh, whodunit itch that you might have. Um, have either of you heard about Curse Correspondence or the Mysterious Package Company before? Oh, well, uh, about Curious Correspondence, yes. I heard of that. It's among the game series. I, I 
I try with my with my group uh, with my group uh, when we play escape room and so on so I have a dedicated group for puzzle games there's a couple of uh, uh, husband and wife uh, who join us and we play evenings so uh, I wanted to intervene here because I, I actually have a question uh, all, all the games on the on this line uh, are usually a bit dark and of course you have to, g to do an, a, an autopsy here so it veers on the dark side quickly I wanted to ask how morbid is this game? Um, I didn't thought that body of evidence was too morbid but because of the puzzle and the fact that you have to conduct an autopsy and all of it I would say it's probably not recommended for kids under 14 for 15 something like that um, yeah it's it's it is not morbid or, or too dark it does not go into any topic besides murder that that i would consider to be um uh dark the uh the story has uh, maybe some hints of, uh, without spoilers, the, the classic murder mystery trope. So either jealousy, money, uh, a love affair, something like that. Um, it gives you a lot of the um, different uh, red herring on, on all of that. But there's nothing that I would, I would say is um, uh, not suited for kids uh, over 14 year old. So uh, basically, you are telling me that it's like play it's like watching Kill Bill. Uh, there is a bit of gore and violence, but uh, you won't have nightmares for that if you're a kid. Yeah, it's it's like um it's like watching an Agatha Christie with an autopsy scene that is uh, mm. not too too graphic. Bones, like watching an episode of Bones. Exactly, exactly like yeah. watching an episode okay. of Bones. <laughs> Thank you. That that's very useful as uh, information. Since I have kids, uh, it's good that uh, maybe we'll yeah. need to wait a couple if, of years for the big one. <laughs> yeah. If you have kids, however, I can tell you that the next episode is going to have something for you. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. I will wait for that. Oh, uh, uh, I, I want to also say a comment about the price point. Uh, 37 euros is a bit uh, is a bit high for a mystery game because you are used to playing mystery games once uh, but it is true that uh, my current line of comparison for that is the is the hidden game series which is 24 euros for about the same time but uh, there's no gimmick no, no cute gimmick like the, the corpse here so probably is fair especially if you like gather uh, like two families or a group of friends and everyone could put like seven or eight euros you can just split the cost and play it once for a good evening yeah that that's what i that's what i'm thinking out of the game like it's it's a little bit more expensive that i would want but the props themselves make uh make it worth it in my in my opinion and yeah, it's it's something that you definitely have to buy, uh, knowing that it's only going to be one big evening, or maybe maybe sp split onto like three um, three one one hour play uh, with friends or something like that. Um, it is it is quite fun though. I if it didn't had that much uh, depth into the props, I would definitely not recommend it. But uh, with that level, I I think that at forty euros, it's it's fine. Okay, so one last question, then I am done. I think I will try it. But you talked about red earrings and the fact that uh, you have a bit of false, of false leads, which is not unheard of, so it's okay. I want just to ask a question without spoilers. Uh, was the resolution of the mystery satisfactory or not? Uh, it was satisfactory. It it oh, felt okay. yeah. Uh, it, it's it felt like one of the good. Um, well, I actually I mentioned Agatha Christie earlier, and Agatha Christie's mysteries are not always um, satisfactory because sometimes it's things that you 
really could not have guessed like oh it was all of them at the same time together <laughs> um this feels a little bit more like uh one of the Don't good say... one of the good mystery where, oh, okay. where you, you have to think of it and you you think about the different people that were involved in it and it makes sense um who who is capable of who would have motive uh and and the capability to murder someone yeah, um, as, lo as long as you don't say Sherlock Holmes as the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I would I would definitely definitely point towards that one. Um, but um, so the the owner of the the restaurant there is found into a freezer. Um, <laughs> the, 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 that's why the name of the body of evidence uh, this this specific game because they're planning to make more is called Best Served Cold because. Uh, <laughs> the, the man is, has been found completely dead and cold and uh, definitely will not wake up. But Refrigerated. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But we can start thinking about what would happen uh, if uh, the dead could come back to life in uh, Dawn of the Zeds, which is a game that Fan is going to talk uh, to us about. And if I believe it is a tower defense, because I think that I played it at a convention years ago. Um, yeah, I would say it's a little bit more than a tower defense game, but we'll get into that. Uh, suffice to say, I'm as well preface it now as you, um, you force me to put the lead out. I hate tower defense games. I, I think it's a lazy, boring genre. Um, but with that said, let's go to Dawn of the Zeds, which is part of the States of Siege series, um, which is a bunch of solo games. And this is the third edition. The first edition was 2011, the second edition was 2013, and this is the 2016 third edition. Um, I think there was a Kickstarter to kind of vamp it all up, um, may be the case, but um, the previous editions are not particularly deluxified. This one is. This is not a cheap game. You're looking at $100, past 1,000 uh, kroner, so like over 100 euros or so. Um, so that's that's expensive, um, but the production does justify the cost on that front. So Dawn of the Zeds takes place in Farmdale. You will play the part of a bunch of um, uh, people from there. There's some heroes, there's some like civilians, there's even a heroic civilian unit. And you will defend against, as mentioned, four lanes of zombies, each one thematically different uh, but mechanically mostly the same there's a highway which does have a nuclear power plant along the way a set of suburbs that has more population centers than the others a winding mountain trail that has a mine part way down it in a campsite and then there's a forestry section like that also has a farm so the differences uh, beyond the vents which i'll get into is that um you have like a better place for foraging bullets in the mine for some reason. Um, you know, I don't actually get that one, uh, but ammo is more of a generic kind of thing. So it may cover explosives and who knows what else. And then it's a higher chance, like more food available at the farm. Um, there is actually a fifth lane as well, but that's for higher complexity. And that's where this game gets like really neat. But before I get there, I'm just going to run you quickly through the base game. So, um, First things first, when you open the box, um, the, this, listen to this, yeah? One, two, three, four. <laughs> That's five rule books. Ha That's a lot to learn. However, it's actually not that bad. What we do have is a basic game rule book that teaches you the basic game. Like, it's an introductory one, and it lays everything out in there. And once you've got to grips with the game, you don't need this book again. Um, unless you're going to play the basic game with other people. Uh, so that's what I'm going to start talking about. But then the second book is a level up book, rule book that tells you the extra rules that are added for each additional level that you go upwards. Each level makes the game more complex and more difficult. So you can almost think about this as being a bunch of expansions because you've got the base game and then you've got the blue level, green level, yellow level, orange level and red level and a Black level, which is for player versus player. I've not played and I'm probably never going to play, but it's there. Um, so that's like a load of expansions all in one box, which is why I think this does justify the price. 
Um, then once you're all set up and you understand what you're going on with, what you've actually got is a comprehensive rule book, a setup, an epilogue book that basically you just need to set up the scenario. And then if you want to read the text for winning or losing, that's there. So you just use that at the start and put it on one side. And the last one is a comprehensive glossary of like a whole load of things because um, Victory Points Games makes war games. And this is in many ways a war game. Um, but it's it's also not because it's focused far more on individuals than anything else. So let's let's talk about the basic game. You will start off and you'll choose yourself a character from a selection in the blue category of characters. Um, each player can do that. This will play up to five players. I'll talk about scaling, but I'll consider the solo game first because everything scales up from that. Uh, so you'll pick your character, you'll randomly get four more, there's always four characters to start, and you'll get a heroic civilian unit, they're like a civilian unit who has something extra special about them. There's like armed guards, or first aid responders, or my personal favourite, which is a bunch of ladies on roller skates with um, sports gear. <laughs> and they're fantastic. Skate team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the Farmdale Furies, I think they're called. Um, and... I, I love them. They're immensely fun. Uh, you'll set up the game based on the scenario. Essentially, each of the tracks has some civilians populated on it. It has a set of zombies at each of the different ones. The zombies have a number indicating their strength on the front side. And then when they take three wounds, they'll flip over to the back side and they have a lowered strength and the three more wounds and they're dead. So it's six hits per zombie to eliminate them. Um, in contrast, your heroes have no health. First hit puts them to the red side, second hit will kill them in the basic game. Uh, your civilian units can take two hits to flip and then two hits to be removed because there's more of them. So that represents the fact that your enemies are, they don't feel pain, you have to basically disable and destroy them, and in contrast people are fragile. Uh, each character will have some unique abilities though. They'll have a variable strength, how good they are, then they will have a movement, uh, and then some other abilities that thematically match. For example, the Sheriff has a leadership ability, so he can command some civilians in his space or adjacent one to do something. Uh, the survivalist nutjob conspiracy theorist has a big old shotgun, so he deals more damage when he shoots, and he's also better at finding and scavenging things. Um, there's there's like uh, so many and uh, different characters, but you are limited by the difficulty level you play as to who you can have in there because they get more complex as you go up the difficulties um yeah uh flow of a turn simple uh, once you're set up you will draw from an event deck that's preset at the start of the game that's your timer for the game you've got to get to the bottom and survive the last card once you do that you win if any zombie reaches the town center it's an immediate loss so you cannot let zombies get past the outer barricades into the space before the town centre because then you're like all or nothing if you don't push them back take them out you're done yeah that, that's the tower defense element yeah it, it is it is but they, as i'm going to talk about the game does a lot of things that manages to differentiate itself from a traditional tower defense and i would argue this is more like a multiplayer moba with multiple different lanes and heroes that have to go out and deal with objectives because the game does not let you turtle up and build towers to defend with. Um, high levels, it provides a little bit extra. Uh, there's definitely like fortification stuff, but yeah, you don't you don't get that. Anyway, so um, in the base game, you will get you'll skip past a bunch of things which involves like uh, extra rules, and you'll get immediately to the zombies, the Zeds as they call them, because Dawn of the Zed, Dawn of the Dead, you know. But I'm just going to call them zombies because we all know they're zombies. Uh, and um, it will tell you what tracks activate. The zombies are going to move one space. It may be one track, it might be two, it might be the same tracks twice. And then there will be a dossier section at the bottom that tells you some special stuff that's going to happen in a particular phase. To start with, that will either be the zombies are doing extra stuff, uh, like maybe they're moving faster, or something unexpected has happened, or it's going to be a, like an event occurring for the uh, the player units, for the survivors, the heroes. Um, like, for example, there's some extra ammo at the campsite. And if you send a, a hero out there to grab it, 
before the end of the turn, then you'll get an extra bunch of bullets. That's like the main thing there. Um, the once the zombies are done, it's a player turn. What's super interesting here is you get one action of your own to spend, and you'll get a number of actions given to you by the event card. So that might be one, two, maybe three, or some of the really bad event cards give you no actions at all, and you go straight to the second, the next event card. Um, in other words, the zombies get to go twice. Like that's quite uh, frightening and exciting when it occurs. Yeah, you'll also, um, some of the characters may have their own special extra actions, as I mentioned before, uh, but you will spend those actions to do various different things. In the base game, that's going to be actions to move up to your movement, usually four for heroes, uh, less for like civilian units, uh, more like two. When you check the reference card, it'll vary. Furies, if I remember correctly, are a bit faster. Uh, or you will fight whenever zombies and player units are in the same space they have to fight this often happens with the zombies advancing in but it can also happen if you step forward and decide to engage with them um, a fight will always be a single round and you will look at the relative strengths of the two sides counting the numbers so zombies say could be at six and you're at three um, that means the zombies have twice your numbers so you'll look on a little table and it'll say this is your two times number um, two times zombie number advantage them and you will then consider any like shifts you have which is uh, you could good terrain because survivors use terrain zombies don't will let you move towards the survive the civilian the player side of the table increasing your odds some characters like the deputy also have like physical hand-to-hand -hand combat capabilities so they'll shift further as well you then roll two dice check the chart it's 2d6 so you get an idea where your results are going to cluster and you know roughly what table you're going to be rolling on. Terrain helps, being in buildings helps, being in barricades near the town centre, that all helps. Um, but it's kind of like quite frightening because you, even on the better sides where it's your advantage, you can end up taking hits. And as I mentioned, you don't have a lot of wounds to spare. You really don't. The civilians can go down really fast. It doesn't help that at the start of the game, some of the civilians are defiant, which means they refuse to move until they get attacked by zombies. You know, it's that classic trope in the movies of, oh, no, there's no zombies. That's ridiculous. Or we'll be safe here inside our house. And then once they get attacked, then they're like, oh, no. And you can start moving them around. But you may not have enough actions to do that. Um, so the whole game hangs together really nicely where you're trying to scavenge for bullets and move civilians around trying to preserve your lines and your units as best as you can against an enemy that is not going to stop until you reach the last card and survive that final push from the zombies or you lose. And that's the base game in like hopefully less than 10 minutes or so. Um, it is really fun. Uh, I'm briefly going to talk about how it scales, which is very simple. Uh, each player will get their own like hero that they choose to play as. Any excess will be NPCs that are like collectively can be used and everyone gets their own action on a turn and then you have the pool of actions to share. So there is a risk of quarterbacking, but I've never experienced that because it works really well to just give someone a job and say, okay, do you want to handle like keep an eye on supplies or do you want to defend a particular areas and let us know if you need help, etc. So quarterbacking is an issue, but sensible play and team working i think always comes out on top unless you've got one of those people who's like i don't know what should i do tell me which mm. just do something this is it's a zombie apocalypse don't get hit by zombies you know shoot them kill them um or go find some food um so yeah that's like really enjoyable that at a baseline one player mode um is the bottom thing that it scales up from the way the zombie scale is you'll have zombie pressures cards. that They're on the cards already. You ignore them at one player. And then for each additional player, they will make more zombies move or do things based on the number of players minus one. So it scales upwards for player count rather than downwards, which feels good and makes it easier to learn to teach to others. All right. Yeah, so uh, I'm very brief. That's the thing is, though, as I said, this you should think of this as a game with a bunch of expansions because there's a load of cards in there for higher difficulties. And I'm gonna briefly, briefly skim through what they're like. So 
at level one, which you could think of as being the standard level, it's still blue tiered, it's called Outbreak, you include healing, which means units can now go to the hospital and get healed. Or if they get killed, half the time they go to the hospital and then you can spend supplies gradually recovering them from being like near to death and getting them back out there. Um, so you now have to think about foraging for supplies because on top of healing with supplies, you need to cover food. The cards actually say you must spend a certain amount of food each turn. You need that, otherwise people start starving because this is like over a number of days. There's also now infection. Whenever uh, certain things increase the infection count, for example, being attacked in hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, uh, or um, units going to the hospital, that kind of stuff, it's logical. Um, sometimes you have to make an infection roll. You roll 2d10 against the number. If you roll equal to or under the number, then you will reduce the infection level by that much and then perform an outbreak, which is a bunch of zombies popping up from one of the settlements nearest to the um, town centre, determined by a fake card. Uh, it, it's like suddenly this game all starts coming together. Like once you once you got to grips with the basic mechanics, out this is like the you can think of the default mode, where you're juggling infection, outbreaks, and you really don't want the outbreak of the infection track to reach the top because it will unleash special unique zombies, and they are you don't know what they're going to be like until they hit the board and they're all terrifying and they do all sorts of ter awful things. Um, and there's also infection, uh, infectors, which is like specific zombie types that increase the infection rate. You're going to have to go out there and get them because they are not going to be easy for you to just sit back and they're going to make the situation get terrible really quickly. Uh, it, it is it's where the game really starts to sing. Now, very briefly, I'm just going to say uh, at apocalypse level up from that, you now have to deal with chaos, which is whenever zombies enter named spaces and take control of them, they cause chaos. If you run out of chaos tokens to put on the board, you lose. You can only reduce chaos by going out to the spaces and dealing with it. So you're forced out of the town centre. Um, you also can then build barricades along the way, which gives you fortifications at spaces where normally you wouldn't have them. But it costs supplies and they're destroyed if the zombies get past them. Uh, there's also now raiders who are NPC factions hostile to you and the zombies. And there's rangers who can help you out. There's refugees that you do not want to get eaten because otherwise they'll cause tons more problems. But they, they're helpless. They can get back to town eventually if you cover them. And then maybe you can give them a gun if you're desperate. But otherwise they're just, they need to be dealt with. They're those, you know, the kind of classic useless characters who just cause problems for the, the heroes. Then at brains level, you get access to research, which... Um, you, you'll have scientist characters who will be looking into like maybe a way a cure to help reduce the infection level or building some kind of cool super weapon to make you stronger. At level four, that's when the extra track turns up. You play on the reverse side of the game and there's now a tunnel. So you have to deal with zombies coming in at five directions and one lot are underground. And then finally at director's cut, sorry, not yeah, yeah is where you start playing... Um, with a versus uh, game and I haven't played that one uh, but it's got a whole load of stuff in there as well it's like the black section of it all um, is the versus part it's I haven't played fully the last level um, but that's what I mean there's so much content in the box and every time you become more um, used to it all then you've got more difficulty you can move to and I believe, Alessio, your time's up. Yeah, sorry about that. It's okay. Uh, yeah, I was listening to the flow, so... <laughs> mm, no, no, no. I unfortunately yeah. couldn't quite get everything done in time. I've got a tiny bit more to talk about. But uh, unless you have a quick question before off, you can say goodbye. Oh, well, uh, actually, uh, just a recommendation of player count. I guess it's solo, but solo, what do you think Solo's about it? the best, but I've played it two player, it's really good, and I've played three and four players, it scales well, but you do need to have people who are like willing to just make decisions and chat about what needs to be handled. If you've got a group of people who are naturally collaborative and will start around by going, okay, what are the threats? What's going on? What am I doing? And divvy out the roles. It works well. Uh, so the game scales fine. It's down to the player group. 
okay, th that's good enough. Like, pand let's say, like a big pandemic. Yeah, yeah, like like pandemic. Yes, very much. Okay, uh, so I guess it's a goodbye. Yep. Okay, we'll catch you next time. Goodbye, Alessio. Take care. Yeah, I I'll try to have my engineer. So let's let oh. tell me if you oh, hear there it. You go. The man in the van. He's been gone. Mm. Yeah. All right. I, one thing that I have to say, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm over uh, zombie bold games that include a traitor mechanic. Yeah, yeah. Um... I think I think I'm glad to not have to play that, especially since we had the best uh, gather resource and and all a traitor game in the thing. Um... Yeah, the uh, the thing's absolutely fantastic. Um, infection outpost. Uh, I want to say 51? Is it 31? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that's the best one. Um, I I like Dead of Winter we talked about in the past, but that's what's yeah, nice about this is it's it's the problems that occur are from NPCs and events and things, not each other. Yeah, I, I like... I, I, I believe that I played it at a convention once, and I remember that a lot of the events that, that happened at... Um, it felt like oh those those um, civilians are not not uh, reacting the way that we wanted and now we have to to deal with that 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 kind of things that felt uh, more what a, a zombie uh, genre to try to have mm -hmm. rather than than what the traitor mechanic is usually for it's because oh you cannot trust anyone but at the table you cannot know the people around you and sometimes the traitor mechanics are just yeah. they feel a bit forced into the game yeah they, uh, they do games. Yeah. i'm glad that dawn of the zed didn't um didn't push those yeah games. it really doesn't need to like you've got dead of winter you've got mall of the dead i think it's more of the dead um, yeah that, that one is one that i played and i really did not like the the traitor I've mechanic in it played it a few times and the the, the sheer level of conf conflict between people is like um it's not my kind of thing uh, yeah. But that's what I like about this. There is a multi a versus mode. I'm not interested in playing it, and I don't feel bad that it's sat in there for people who do. Um, but everything else that's going on is just so good. Uh, the the game is because they've taken this war game mechanic, and I don't like war games, and I don't like tower defense games. But you like neither of those. Yes. I like neither of those, and I love Dawn of the Zeds. It is definitely in my top twenty solo games. I think it's like an eight or a nine out of ten. I need to play it more at higher difficulties to really figure out where it goes. But the fact that it is so modular that you can play a nice, simple, like game with where you're just worrying about ammo and just worrying about the zombies coming in and the events, that's like great. But then you go, well, I want more. And you can end up right at the top end with this incredibly rich, detailed game uh, full of stuff. But at every level, there's crazy emergent stories. The first time I sat down to play this with my gaming group, we played three player and it was it was a dream. It was so good for the three of us. But we had um, we had one extra p character, the NPC, and that was Deputy Schmidt. And he has his own action. So it was perfect. Because basically, you know, he was able to manage himself. We didn't have to look after him too much because he could just do things. We get near the end of the game. The town centre is almost overrun. Schmidt, up in the farm track at the farm, has been holding off like three sets of zombies. That's like six zombies in a train. And he's all by himself. <laughs> he's just not failing. He's not taking any damage. He's passing his tough rolls when he fails. He's getting back in there immediately pushing the zombies back and we couldn't get anyone out any civilians out to help him we were so swamped we were like if schmidt drops we gotta hope the farm track doesn't go anywhere like they, they stop trying to come in through the farm turns out at the end of the game they came storming in through the suburbs and schmidt was the only one who managed to hold the line so <laughs> we were like this is deputy schmidt's origin story this is this is like the first episode where the town he's in gets overrun everyone dies horribly and and he's the one who heads off like we were all outshone by an npc and it felt really fun um that is quite fun. it is and every every card in the game for a character has on the back of it like a little bit of backstory that so that's why i know like the survivalist is a conspiracy nut because that's what it says um and it, it's amazing how much it elevates everything it's a beautiful looking production uh and everything in it is just the way that they took this solo only game 
and expanded it to work co-op um, and updated everything. It's expensive, but I think it's worth the price. Essentially, if you didn't like the base game, there's nothing the extra stuff's going to do that will change your mind, in my opinion. So if I talked about the base mechanics and you went, oh, I'm so over zombies, not interested, or I don't like the sound of this because combat involves rolling dice and everything can go horribly wrong, then, yeah, it's, it's not for you. But if... If this whole like thing it grabs you and you're like I love emergent storytelling, I love it when like these little narratives crop up and characters come to life during the game through mechanics and either they happen to be a terrible series of events or they beat the odds or somebody spends all their time getting clobbered and going back to hospital and then crawling out of it um, for another round. It's amazing. It's it's really joyful. And on top of that, the game clearly has a massive tongue in cheek. So uh, like. Look at it all. Yeah, so, yeah. There's a lot of a uh, cinema and movie reference to it. There, it's, there is that helps. Let, yeah, that helps making it a little bit. Uh, too many zombie games take themselves too seriously yeah. when it's a genre that no has veered into the camp. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. So, like your starting characters are all pretty like defined. There's the deputy, the sheriff, the ex-military sniper, the mayor, and the like. Cons- conspiracy nut survivalist uh, scavenger but then as we start going like through the higher levels and also the expansions here we go we've got general lee he's a horse people can ride uh-huh. on him or we've got um pickles the dog who's great at finding stuff and zombies will ignore him because they don't want to eat a dog well most of the time they don't want to eat a dog or el toro loco who's literally a, a luchador he he's amazing in hand-to-hand combat um and uh like and shoving back um, zombies and keep creating space, or uh, you've got like um, one of the expansions has a dude in a truck. That's that's who you play as, Big Wheels Carter. He never gets out of his truck, so he can't go to some of the tracks because his truck won't go there. Um, it it's and and then um, up near the top end we have uh, Horatius, who is a reference to Planet of the Apes. He's a you know, that classic, uplifted, sentient, sapient chimpanzee. That is quite yeah, fun. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of why it's also a bit different to me, is because it is happy to look at all of these things and just be like, you know what, we're going to get a bit silly with this. We're going to get a bit crazy. And you can play a game where the town is defended by a horse, a dog, a monkey, and a truck. <laughs> Good luck. And that's that's the other part. Replayability is crazy. All the different difficulty levels, you choose what you feel like playing at. Um, and then all the different characters, you could pick them, you could randomise them, see what you can do with it. There is so much in this. Um, and I, I've not even got scratched. I bought the three expansions. I've, outside of playing the characters, I've not had a chance to play with them. Like one of them gives you rumours, like places you go to and you may find you'll find something that might be beneficial. Um, one of them gives you some trains. I have no idea how they work, but you've got trains running backwards and forth on the tracks, um, which is really interesting as well. So it's... I I, I originally was going to talk about War of the Ring, the card game, the cooperative game. And when they accidentally delivered me the core box set again, I was like, what am I going to talk about? And the first game I looked at, I didn't want to talk about because I felt it wasn't a good fit um, for reasons that I won't go into, but I discussed in the Discord. And uh, then I looked up in the uh, like the top of the stairs and I saw this um, like olive coloured box and I went, you know what? It's about time I talked about Dawn of the Zeds because it is something special. It's something that it is a, if you like what you've heard, you really should make it a part of your collection. And if you're not sure, there's a module on Tabletop Simulator. You could learn to play the base game. And if you have a fun time, just know that it gets deeper and it gets more and more fun. So there we are. Dawn of the Zeds. That is quite a recommendation. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I wanted to preface it with, I don't like the genre, but I feel like this <laughs> this elevates beyond the genre. Like Castle Panic. I've played Castle Panic. No, thank you. Don't don't like it. Um, I like Dead of Winter, yeah. but I feel this is so different. And as you said, you, Dead of Winter without a traitor can work, but you have to ramp the difficulty up and it always doesn't quite feel there. This has all of that, but constantly cooperative so wonderful mm. i guess that's all the time that we have for this episode then 
Um, you can catch us over at patreon.com slash the last um, That said, uh, until next time, we've been the last Andy. It's uh, going to be a goodbye from uh, Alessio, who's already left. The man in the van, uh, fe- yeah. <laughs> Fem. Goodbye. And myself. Uh, but remember that the second E in Standy is for evidence. Evidence.